natural and special revelation. Peter's Epistles No. 11 by Dr. Robert D. Luganbill Review As we mentioned in our last study, the book of 1 Peter is greatly concerned with spiritual growth, especially in respect to the role which suffering plays as an agent in the Christian growth process. We therefore need to examine the doctrine of spiritual growth in some detail before moving on with our exegesis. It will, moreover, be profitable for us to do so, for the very purpose of our lives as Christians is to grow spiritually and to help others to do the same. Helping others to grow is called ministry and depends in part upon each individual's specific spiritual gift. The process of growth, on the other hand, is the same for all Christians. Although it is a broad topic, spiritual growth does have a single simple focus, truth. To put the matter as plainly as possible, spiritual growth consists primarily of learning God's truth and applying it to our lives. Truth, therefore, is the key to the Christian life. Truth, so what is truth? To begin with, we can say that in the midst of the devil's world, God's truth is the one thing that can pull us out of our self-centered preoccupation with our own problems and orient us to God's plan, to God's will. Truth alone instructs us, comforts us, encourages us, and points out the direction in which we should go. More than any other principle, it is the knowledge and application of God's truth which distinguishes believers in the Lord Jesus Christ from the rest of the world, and Jesus proclaimed that the reason for his earthly ministry was to bear witness to that same truth. When he was being interrogated by Pontius Pilate, John chapter 18 verse 37 and 38, Jesus said, You say that I am a king. Yes, for this very purpose I have been born, and I have come into the world in order that I might testify to the truth. Pilate's response to Jesus was, What is truth? While Pilate was never really interested in God's truth, for believers, truth is the food, the very mother's milk by which we live and grow, 1 Peter 2.2. 2. So how should we answer Pilate's question? What is truth really? First, all truth comes from God, for God is the truth. Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. To know Jesus Christ, then, is to know the truth. But how this side of heaven? Can we ever hope to fully know the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent Creator? In His grace, God has provided mankind with a specific body of truth for use in this life, a treasury of knowledge which is both knowable and usable. This body of truth is divisible into two broad categories. Truth available to all mankind through natural revelation. Truth that is only accessible to believers in Jesus Christ by way of special or supernatural revelation. Natural revelation, God is the creator of the universe, Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. Accordingly, the universe and all that is in it bears the mark of its creator. We can tap into this category of truth by observing the creation and marveling at its magnitude and complexity. Now while there is admittedly much that can be learned about the nature of God in this empirical way, the scripture emphasizes two principal truths that God has designed for the unbeliever to derive from contemplating the natural world. The fact of God's existence is plain from contemplating God's creation. Psalm chapter 19 verse 1 through 6 states that the heavens tell of God's glory. That is, by contemplating the majesty of the universe, the beauty of the creation, men know in their hearts that a creator has to exist. Paul also affirms this point unequivocally. For that which can be known about God from everyday experience is obvious to them, because God has made it obvious. His nature, though invisible, is nevertheless plainly apparent, and has been since his foundation of the world, for it may be clearly inferred from this creation of his. This is true of both his eternal power and his divinity, so that they are without any excuse. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 Moreover, Paul's statement here advances the argument beyond what the psalmist had to say. In Romans chapter 1 verse 20, we not only see the fact of God's existence from the marvelous nature of His creation, but we also derive from studying His creation some idea of just what sort of God He is. He is just and righteous in addition to being all-powerful. This concept is amplified in the second truth which men can learn from pondering nature. 
The fact of God's existence is plain from contemplating the concept of right and wrong. Also in Romans, Romans chapter 2 verse 14 through 16, Paul explains that some Gentiles who do not have God's word to guide them nevertheless do what is right instinctively Greek physei by nature. This is because God has implanted in the conscience of all mankind the essential ideas of right and wrong. Paul goes on to say that the conscience of these Gentiles sometimes approves their actions and sometimes condemns them. Verse 15. So a consciousness of sin is also part of our human heritage as descendants of Adam and Eve. Compare Proverbs chapter 20 verse 27, where evaluation of the heart is a natural function of man's spirit. Without any direct communication from God, without any visitation from angels, without any Bible teaching, indeed without even a Bible, all mankind is aware of certain spiritual truths from their observation of matters plainly obvious to everyone. Whether they wish to acknowledge the fact or not, in truth all people realize that there is a God who made the world and who made them. All understand that He is a just and righteous God. All comprehend that there is right and wrong, good and evil. And all know that no matter how good they may try to be, they are not without evil themselves. These points are all the more true following the advent of the Holy Spirit, John chapter 16, verse 8 through 11. God in His matchless grace has so ordered the world that even without any missionary contact or special signs, all mankind is aware of the fundamental problem of life. We all face death, and without some sort of help, we all face the problem of confronting a just and righteous God who surely exists, with no excuse for the evil we have done in our lives. In their hearts, at some point in their lives, if only for a brief moment everyone comes to this realization, one would think that this would be motivation enough to desire more information about God, for if there is to be a solution, then clearly it must rest with God Himself.